This video was made possible through the support of my patrons. It's hard to imagine now, but when Doctor Who was first created in 1963, its success and longevity was hardly guaranteed. In fact, despite being the brainchild of the new BBC head of drama, Sidney Newman, it could have been cancelled after just four episodes. I went over the Cliff Notes origins of Doctor Who in my last video, where I reviewed An Unearthly Child, but one thing that I didn't elaborate on was the official pilot episode of the show's first serial. Because while An Unearthly Child was broadcast on November 23rd, 1963 after being filmed on October 18th, it wasn't the first attempt to stage the episode. Believe it or not, there exists an alternate cut of the episode that was filmed a month earlier, and this original version almost killed the show stone dead before it could even start. What happened? How does it differ from the original? And was it really that bad? Let's dive into Doctor Who The Unaired Pilot. So what was the pilot episode of Doctor Who? Well basically, it was a testing ground that was never meant for publication. The creative team, cast and crew, they came together to create the first episode of the show and experiment with ideas to find out what works and to iron out any issues before they can become a long term problem or hinder production proper. Television pilots are commonplace in TV, so let's dispel the myth that this particular pilot was so terrible that it had to be refilmed because it was so bad in and of itself. Some pilots go to broadcast unedited as just the first episode of the season. But it's rarely a cut and dry thing, and a portion of a show's budget is often set aside to make a pilot that is not intended for the public's eyes. A more modern equivalent of this is the 60 minute pilot episode of BBC Sherlock, which you can view on the show's home media release, and that was the testing ground for a show that would later expand to 90 minute episodes, with that first one adapting the pilot story to become a study in pink. So, how did this Doctor Who story even get released in the first place? I mean, think about it. Nearly 40% of Doctor Who's first six years were wiped from the BBC archives or missing. We don't have any of Marco Polo, most of the Daleks' master plan is gone, and so many others. So what happened? Well, a tele-recording of the pilot was made during the 1960s, but it was thought to have been junked towards the end of the decade. However, it was discovered in 1978 in a mislabeled film canister. Presumably, this mislabeling saved it from destruction, and it made its first official broadcast during the wilderness years in 1991 as part of a series of programs to mark the closure of Lime Grove Studios, one of the main studio homes for Doctor Who during the 1960s. Personally, I find it absolutely wild that we're missing Doctor Who's first Christmas special, William Hartnell's final episode, Patrick Troughton's first episode, and more landmark moments, but we're able to watch this pilot that was never intended to be broadcast that predates everything. So with this pilot available to watch, what can we learn from it? Well, we know that the production itself was cursed from the beginning. It was originally scheduled to be filmed in Lime Grove Studios on September 13th, 1963. However, it had to be called off when the set dressers arrived and realized that the police public call box prop was far too tall to fit in the studio lift. Also, I just want to point out that this was a Friday, as in Friday the 13th of September. Typical. So filming was rescheduled for six days later, on September 19th, and that's the filming that we can still see today. The actual plot and structure of the An Unearthly Child episode is basically unchanged. The scene orders take place the same way, the sets are the same, the cast are the same. Barring the police officer from the opening shot, here played by Fred Rawlings, and he was replaced by Reg Cranfield during the remount. What's different though is the characterization, mainly of the Doctor and Susan. The Doctor in this version lacks the smiling, more playful nature from the final version. In fact, the Doctor in the pilot episode almost reads as cruel, getting much angrier at Susan for having their ship in the junkyard discovered. His outfit is more plain, not wearing the Edwardian garments, but rather a much more modern suit and tie combination, reflecting his less eccentric performance. Frankly, I don't understand your attitude. Your yours leaves a lot to be desired. Will you open the door? There's nothing in there. Then what are you afraid to show us? Afraid? <laughs> go away. I think we'd better go and fetch a policeman. Very well. And you're coming with us? 
Oh, am I? <laughs> I don't think so, young man. No, I don't think so. And I don't understand your attitude. Yours leaves a lot to be desired. Will you open that door? I will not. Why not? What are you afraid we'll find there? Go away. Open the door. I certainly will not. Pushing your way in here. And I think we'd better find a policeman. Very yeah, well. And you're coming with us. Oh, am I? I think not. We can't force him. But we can't leave him here. Doesn't it seem obvious to you he's got her locked up in there? Look at it. There's no door handle. Must be a secret lock somewhere. That was Susan's voice. Of course it was. You can't force him. We can't leave him here. Doesn't it seem obvious to you that he's got her locked up in there? Look at it. There's no handles. There's... I know that the Doctor could be interpreted as the villain in the finished version anyway, but there he was a chaotic but charming trickster, whereas here he's a grumpy git with a real mean streak, though I've got to admit some of the different lines and Hartnell's delivery of them is a home run. I know that free movement in the fourth dimension of space and time is a scientific dream I didn't expect to find solved in a junkyard. For your science, schoolmaster, not for ours. I tell you, before your ancestors turned the first wheel, the people of my world had reduced movement through the farthest reaches of space to a game for children. But yeah, that cold glare he gives, the way he turns his nose up, it is very similar to Hartnell's prior roles as authority figures. A great performance, but I don't think it's right for the role. And Sidney Newman agreed, failing to see the twinkle in the Doctor's eye that he thought was key to the character. Also key to the character, the mystery of where he and Susan came from. In the broadcast version, Susan is pretty vague about where she comes from. Do you look like us? You sound like us. I was born in another time, another world. But in the pilot, they outright give us a time period. You look like us, you sound like us. I was born in the 49th century. Susan is portrayed as much more alien in this version, whether it's her general attitude or her body language, which, apart from the alien dancing in her introductory scene, seems a bit more rigid here. Also, when Ian and Barbara leave her alone in the classroom, she doesn't read a book on the French Revolution and spot a mistake. Instead, she does an ink blot Rorschach on a nearby piece of paper, and then paints a hexagon around it before crumpling the paper away and looking concerned. I'm guessing the hexagon is meant to resemble the TARDIS console, but this just seems unprovoked, and it asks the wrong kinds of questions in the viewer. This was a scene that Sidney Newman specifically requested to be changed, having no idea what it was meant to imply. Honestly though, there's not actually that much more different when it comes to the core fundamentals of the script, apart from the Doctor seemingly deliberately sabotaging the TARDIS console to shock Ian when he tries to open the doors, whereas in the broadcast version, it's seems to be an established TARDIS security measure. But speaking of the TARDIS doors, let's talk about the technical issues. See, the pilot version of the episode disappointed Sidney Newman creatively, that was certain, but it was the technical issues and the frequent flubs and mistakes that made the episode unbroadcastable. The TARDIS doors, which were manually operated by stage crew, would not shut during the first take, causing frequent banging and clattering. These people are known to you, I believe. What are you doing here? They're two of my school teachers. Is that your excuse for this unwarrantable intrusion? You had no right to invite them here. I blame you for this, Susan. Now you're probably thinking, why didn't director Waris Hussein just call cut and start again? Well, this was a TV production in the 1960s. Restarting the cameras is a time-consuming and expensive ordeal. Time is money, and the team only had 75 minutes in the studio to film the episode. Otherwise, at 9.45pm, the lights in the studio would go out. No ifs or buts. Because of this, regardless of any flubs or mistakes, the show had to go on, which is why in classic Doctor Who, many flubs and mistakes remain in the broadcast version. It's possible that they may have been anti-radiation gloves. Drugs. The doors are easily the most notable mistake in the pilot. From when the Doctor, Ian and Barbara enter the TARDIS, 
the doors are in a near constant state of movement for over a minute. No doubt, Waris Hussein was pulling his hair out in the gallery, as depicted in the 2013 biopic An Adventure in Space and Time. What, what's happening to the bloody doors? The biopic does play up the technical issues of the pilot, however. While the cameras were cumbersome to move, they actually moved quite freely on the TARDIS set, or at least they appear to. And no, the sprinkler system did not cause them to abandon filming midway through. Although that was an issue in this studio for productions such as The Reign of Terror later on in the season. That's not to say, however, that the cameras never abruptly stopped. While the first two acts of the pilot, the scenes at the school and the scene in the junkyard, were successfully recorded in one go, the final setup in the TARDIS took three attempts. The first take is the one where the doors malfunctioned, but they did manage to complete the episode. The second take is quickly abandoned, as the hum of the TARDIS sound effect stops working after a few seconds and it's called off. All right, we're ready. I'm not coming right now. What? What? And then the cameras rolled again for a third take, which once again took the team to the end credits. As for mistakes, let's get the other big ones out of the way. When Ian and Barbara meet Susan, Caroline Ford had to extend her dance sequence by a few extra seconds as Jacqueline Hill and William Russell struggle to get through the doorway. Jacqueline appears to get caught on something. When talking about the chart placement of the band Susan is listening to, Caroline Ford flubs the line and corrects herself. It's John Smith and the Common Men. They've gone from 2 to 19, 19 to 2 in hit parade. Not bad. A stagehand gets caught in the background when Ian and Barbara are in the car outside of the junkyard, and while it's not strictly speaking a flub, the lighting isn't very well placed on Ian's face, as it's mostly in shadow, something fixed in the broadcast version. When exploring the junkyard, the set is so cluttered that it created numerous issues. For example, while Ian falling over and dropping the torch is scripted, he's not meant to knock over all of those props. Oh. We also have the cameras struggling to move around on the set, frequently bumping their way into position, and at one point, one runs into some set dressing. What's a police box? What on earth is it doing here? They're always in the street. Uh, feel it. Feel it. You feel it? The TARDIS itself also presented a few problems for the camera team, where they obviously wanted to capture its massive scope. It's quite a literal scope, in fact, as the set took up almost half of Studio D in Lime Grove, but the roof of the studio can be seen in the first establishing shot killing the illusion, something fixed for the broadcast version. Some of the blocking is off as well, with Caroline Ford completely obstructing the camera's view of Hartnell at the beginning of the scene. However, despite all of these issues, there are a few interesting production differences with this pilot version. For example, the fog in the opening scene is removed, and we get a clearer look at the TARDIS, which looks clean and pristine, as opposed to looking much more weathered in the show itself. There's even a few more ambitious setups here with the camera, with the TARDIS interior actually actually visible through the doors when Ian and Barbara forced their way through, something the classic series would never repeat again, despite it now being commonplace in the revival. There's also a really ambitious camera move when Susan announces the name of the ship, something much more visually understated in the final version. The TARDIS can go anywhere. TARDIS? I don't understand you, Susan. Well, I made up the name TARDIS from the initials, time and relative dimension in space. TARDIS can go anywhere. TARDIS? I don't know what you mean, Susan. I made up TARDIS from the initials. Time and relative dimension in space. Also, the sound of the TARDIS' dematerialization was different to what we know today, with a lot more generic science fiction beeps and boops added. Despite the production team's best efforts, however, Sidney Newman wasn't happy, calling the pilot, and I quote, 
the worst piece of work I've seen in a long time, and almost fired Waris Hussein and Verity Lambert after they seemingly wasted the episode's budget of £2,100. He especially hated the musical theme, which was a slightly different version for this opening, with what sounds like a thunderclap near the beginning. <laughs> Test pilots are commonplace, and no one expected this to wind up perfect, but it was thought to be so bad as to wonder whether or not Doctor Who should even bother continuing. But Sidney Newman, as the head of drama, decided to sink another £2,000 into the budget and completely restage the intro with another draft of the script, altering the tone and the characterization. With the show going over budget, there were genuine conversations behind the scenes as to whether or not Doctor Who should just be cancelled after its four episode run, especially since the new alien suit props for the next story were starting to become very expensive to make. It's only thanks to the passion of Verity Lambert, who had crunched the numbers on the budget that could be distributed to make up for the overspending of the first serial, that the show continued. And the rest is history. Hey folks, thank you so much for watching this review of a story, or a pilot I should say, that I've wanted to talk about for literally years, and this Hartnell Marathon I thought was the best opportunity for me to do so. If you enjoyed this review, then be sure to hit that like button, it really, really helps me out, and also leave a comment down below with your thoughts on this review, or on the pilot in general. And if you want to see more reviews like this, then be sure to hit that subscribe button as well, so you can be notified of whenever I do another Doctor Who video. But the best way to support these reviews is via Patreon. You can see all my patrons on screen right now scrolling down with the credits but these people also get these reviews in some cases several months early because of youtube content id stuff get their names in the credits get access to a mr titus discord server but i'd like to give a shout out to these particular patrons adam gratton angus wajanison callum baird chiba city blues dan the dreamer shill daniel davis darius darren carver bausiger dean jones dr hadley dragon bugs dylan whittaker Evil Dalek 79, Finley Rude, Flipmeister MK, Ginger Animator, Hunter Graham, Jack D. Evans, James Ivory, Jared Saylor, John Campbell Reese, Joseph Adams, Leela, Zachary Taylor, aka Mario Fanboy 15, Matthew Perry, Michael Serrano, Miranda Logan, Nate Harris, Nathaniel Holden, Palex, Raven Woods, Reese Lloyd, Ross, Samuel Whitaker, Steve Fiore, Taylor Wooderson, The Brit Sniper, Timbo1834, Toby Loxton, Will, Zabi555, and Strange Folk. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, thank you to you for watching this video, and I'll see you folks next time.